The smoke has cleared. The dust has settled from the penultimate World Cup qualifying window for CONCACAF. The United States, last time out, I should have stuck to my guns. I said six-point window out of respect for Canada. Then I changed it because of Alfonso Davies, but I should have gone with my first instinct. Six points it was. And the last three points in Honduras obviously puts them in a much safer situation, but it is still touch and go here for the U.S. Much better position than they were five years ago when they were trying to qualify for Russia. They've put themselves in the right spot. Now you got to finish the job. And today, here on the Soccer OG, we're going to look at what the U.S. needs to do to make sure that they qualify. And then when they get to Qatar, they have a team that can truly compete. And I believe they will have one once they get out of CONCACAF and face some top teams that they can play with. We might see the real U.S. stand up. Thanks to everybody who... Uh, contributed thanks to l3 online as we did our remote broadcast from tony p's we got great response from a lot of people who said come out to long beach come down to orlando come to texas to do a, a live remote and we certainly are hoping to do that and we will be moving forward all the way through 2022 after all this is a world cup year check out the soccer og podcast where all podcasts are available coming out on monday i'll be joined by taylor rockwell of the total soccer show that should be a nice chin wag for sure. And yes, please like and subscribe to Soccer OG here on YouTube. Let's get these numbers going. The numbers have been great across the board for everything. And I thank you. I am eternally grateful. Let us take a look at where everything stands. We'll see a lot about this. And from now until late March, it's going to be nerve wracking. We're going to get sweaty palms. We're going to be worried sick and hopefully... Things get resolved early so that the U.S. can forget about qualifying, get their ticket, and then start preparing for the World Cup. Remember, April, early April, we have a draw. We have a World Cup draw, which should... Uh, I can't... Re I, I remember not being able to see the United States in the last World Cup draw, and it was just the most depressing thing ever. I don't want to go through that again. We won't. We won't. The U.S. will make it. So this is what it looks like. Canada has 25 points. USA and Mexico at 21, USA with a slightly better goal differential. Panama has 17, Costa Rica has 16. And I mentioned Costa Rica because that is the wild card because what they were able to do, getting seven points in the last window, uh, and, and some, truck, some tricky opposition, now worst case scenario for the US if they bottom out is not finishing fourth and going to the playoff, it's finishing fifth like they did five years ago and missing everything because of the emergence of Costa Rica, who were done and dusted by the end of 2021. But the resurgence has been strong and they are back in the mix. And we all know underestimate Costa Rica at your own peril. Costa Rica, quarterfinalists in the World Cup. They're just a great program. And it looked like they were bottoming out, but they have come back strong. Howell Campbell, fantastic team. And look, they could get nine points in this window. They face Canada at home. Canada might be slightly checked out because they would have qualified already. They're not going to force the issue, I don't think. But then again, Canada has a goal here and they have been uncompromising. They will keep going. So it's not, it's not an easy game, but it's at home for a Costa Rica team playing very well with a great goalkeeper. Then they travel to El Salvador. And then they take on the United States. And uh, the United States has not fared well against Costa Rica. Really, home or away. And I know we will be a nervous wreck if we go to that final game we haven't qualified. I don't even want to think about it. I apologize for breathing that into existence. But keep it in the back of your brain. So for the United States, these three games coming up. Mexico, USA, at the Azteca. USA could certainly get points here. There will be fans for Mexico this time after missing fans the last two games. And Mexican fans have to be on their best behavior because not being there hurt their national team. They are better with fans, drop points to Costa Rica, and barely escaped Panama. And no matter what you think about the chant, maybe it gets lost in translation. There are some cultural differences, which I stand by. Still, 
It is viewed poorly across the board. It's going away and the Mexican fans will be punished and Mexico will be punished if it resurfaces. So don't do it. Don't do it. The big game for the United States is at home against Panama three days later. Got to win that game. And they should. And that was a game in Orlando five years ago. I think it was the next to last game in the U.S. won before Cuba happened. But that will get Panama out of the, the picture. And then you wait and see uh, what other teams are doing. Then they travel to Costa Rica. Four points the USA are in. I know that sounds absurd, but we're not getting a six-point window here. I just don't see it. That's a very difficult three games. Two on the road at two of the hardest places, if not the two hardest of places in CONCACAF, notwithstanding Canada, which has emerged here. Uh, not historically significantly difficult, but now it is. And that's a good thing for CONCACAF, as we've touched on here. So with that information, let us go through the... the I found five big issues the United States have to resolve. And they don't have to completely resolve these, but to some degree to get better. And I think we all agree that the number one on this list is getting better striker play. It's disappeared. Even the last cycle, no goals from strikers. There was a goal from Jedi Robinson, there was a goal from Walker Zimmerman, Weston McKinney, and then there was uh, a goal from Christian Pulisic. Ricardo Pepe is the number one, but it's not his job. He has gone cold. Uh, really got to go all the way back to October since he scored for club or country, but really it's gone, it's gone completely dark with regards to nothing at Augsburg yet. Didn't play this weekend. And then also you have FC Dallas. He didn't finish well. And even for the national team, it hasn't scored. I still foresee Ricardo Pepe as our number one. He's valued at $20 million. That's for a reason. But it's not his job. You get the guy who can contribute. Who are the other options? I would rule out Jussie Zardes didn't play well. And I, Greg Berhalter has been loyal to some of those older guys, but they have gone by the wayside. Uh, Leggett, Roldan, Ariola are not featured players. Did not above, Between them played a few minutes this t last time around. And maybe Zardes is held, heading in that direction too. Jordan Peefock. He is the hot commodity right now. Two more goals this weekend for young boys. 18 in all competitions on the season. He really should be in there on form alone. A little bit different, good towering guy stylistically and with regards to the way the U.S. plays. It's not a great fit in the eyes of Greg Berhalter. I kind of agree with him, but with this form, you got to get him in. Daryl DK, injured right now, has to focus on his club, he might be a player on this roster by the time the World Cup rolls around. But for this next window, focus on getting West Brom promoted once he gets healthy again. Jesus Ferreira, I like him in the inner circle. Not your traditional number nine, but will be on that squad. If he was able to score against El Salvador, maybe we're talking about him and he changes this conversation a whole lot. But he didn't. And then the wild card is Josh Sargent. Scored those two goals for Norwich against Watford. Playing now in a couple positions. New management. Norwich playing much better. His confidence is going to rise up. I think we'll see him as well uh, getting a look here in that next window. So there are options. But somebody has to step up. Somebody has to step up. We need goals. Now, the second issue directly relates to that. Because not scoring goals if you're number nine is not just your fault uh, by itself, right? It's not something you need help. And the way the U.S. plays, the fullbacks get up. They're the ones who go to the byline and they bring the service in. But their crosses are hitting the first defender. Their crosses are not getting airborne. It's very frustrating. Jedi Robinson's been a revelation, but the one thing he hasn't done well is cross a ball. And it's... I mean, this has been going on for eight, nine games. These balls have to get in. Serginho Des, kind of a similar problem. Reggie Cannon played some, wasn't great. DeAndre Yedlin uh, has had his moments. Somebody has to be able to cross the ball. And if it means Des comes to the other side, so be it. But uh, I can't keep seeing these balls bouncing off left and right backs defensively. It's very frustrating. 
The pecking order after that, again, I don't want to say I told you so, but people came after me when I said Joe Scali is now out of favor at Mönchengladbach. Another game where he didn't start, he didn't play at all. If he doesn't play, he's not getting called in. George Bello, his first game for Armenia Bielefeld, uh, did come off the bench. Maybe there's something there. Maybe Brian Reynolds, when he settles in with his new club. Again, there are options, but somebody has to prove that they can cross a ball. One fullback. If not, you have some sort of systematic change where the fullbacks aren't crossing from the wide areas. It's a problem. And that will help the first issue if that can come around. So that's two. Again, these are just small degrees of improvement that will help the United States immensely. When I say small degrees, one or two crosses get through. Number three, set pieces. And what does it mean or what does it do to the lineup? So Kellen Acosta, three set pieces that led to all three goals against Honduras. Kellen Acosta is, is, a, is an inconsistent player. And Tyler Adams, when he returns, would slot in front of him in that deep-lying midfield role. You would think. The midfield looked locked in. Musa, and then obviously McKenney. McKenney is a lockdown, in-ink starter. He's our best player right now. And then Tyler Adams. Christian Pulisic didn't start against Honduras. Can you give him the set pieces when he has done nothing in that department in a long time and keep in mind when he's at Chelsea there are seven players who have taken a set piece and I said this in the last video there are seven players who've taken a set piece for Chelsea this season penalties corners free kicks Pulisic is not one of them Ben Chilwell is one of them Reese James is one of them but not Christian Pulisic so he's not taking set pieces there which is not going to help him here we need someone to take set pieces as we saw against Honduras. And right now, Kellen Acosta is the best candidate. But do you put him in? And where do you put him in? Uh, this Tyler Adams situation could be... Or uh, there's some sort of movement at the top. Is it, is it Gio Reyna who we'll get to in a moment? Somebody has to take these set pieces. Kellen Acosta is our best bet. And to me, you've got to find a way to get him in there then. Luca Della Torre played well. Not that he's taking set pieces, but you can see this midfield is all of a sudden not etched in stone. McKenney is. Tyler Adams, eh, close. And then Musa might be the outside looking in. Do you get Acosta in that position? Do you bring Acosta in as a fullback? You've got to get him in. Unless he has a shocker, we're going to get... These three games, they have set piece written all over them. They have set piece written all over them and crosses. That's why we got to fix this. Kellen Acosta is our best set piece taker. And that's not saying a lot. It's not a strong point for the United States. And these were the first set piece goals they scored in qualifying. That has to be fixed. But who moves out of the lineup to accommodate it? That's a huge decision. Huge. Mentioned Gio Reyna. That is number four on my list, and it was great to see Gio come in, played 29 minutes for Dortmund, even though they got the doors blown off of them by Bayer Leverkusen. But it's a perfect time. Now he has five, six weeks to get in the groove, get some minutes. He is going to be there. The question is, how do you incorporate him? Where does he play? When we saw the attacking front lines, uh, it was Pulisic, Ferreira, Wea in the first game, Pulisic, Zardes, Aronson in the second, Wea, Pepe, Morris in the next. Uh, Pulisic, people started talking about using him as a super sub. It's not the worst idea, but I think you want him in there. So let's say Pulisic, Pepe, and then what? Wea or Reyna? And Aronson's the guy who's on the outside looking in. Or maybe Reyna comes a little deeper, but then what do you... <laughs> It's another big dilemma. And what you want to do if you're Greg Berhalter is eliminate dilemmas. You want as few of those as possible. You want to get into your team and say, he's starting here, he's starting here. I'm good at least in six or seven positions. But where does Gio Reyna go? I'm not 100% sure. I'm not a, I think you go Reyna, Wea, Pepe, or maybe do this false nine business. I'm starting to get a little nervous again with my, 
my talking points. So that's a big one there as well. But the good news is Gio Reyna's back. And you got to make sure he's ready. I think he will be. And when he's there, you find a spot for him. The good news is depth is going to be a huge positive, And the U.S. can use that to their favor. And remember, it's three games where you can move around a little bit. The final thing on my list is who is your starting center back combo? I want to just reiterate that I, I said this as well, that those three center backs were going to play all three games and they did. And our defense is excellent. Our defending is really good from that position. Take the Canada late goal where Miles Robinson got skinned there and they were pressing, but they really allowed the one goal, a freakish goal. And in the other two games, they got clean sheets and not many clear-cut opportunities for either team there. We had Zimmerman and Richards in the El Salvador game. Richards and Miles Robinson in Canada. Zimmerman and Robinson in the last game because Chris Richards had an ankle injury. Who is the best partnership there? It is those three guys. John Brooks, we can talk about. He is not better than any of these three guys. Okay? I know he, Wolfsburg is playing better. John Brooks is not an upgrade to what we've seen in our central defense. I like the guys we have. Maybe John Brooks gets called in, but I don't want it to mix up with the identity of what has been created, which is very good for the U.S. Mild Robinson was the golden child. Chris Richards has come a long way, and I think Walker Zimmerman works best with both of them. So I think Zimmerman gets in, and I think it's Richards, which was the combination against El Salvador. But again, three games, all three will play. But I don't want another player other than those three guys in the starting 11 when those games start to fall. And no other center back played. No other center back played in those last three games. So we talk about Mark McKenzie or uh, John Brooks, or if we go even further down the pecking order, I'm not sure who's going to be there, but it's those three guys. Eliminate the dilemma. Eliminate the dilemma. And there you have it. We're going to talk a lot more about the U.S. Men's National Team, World Cup qualifying, the draw in April. Everything's falling into place. What an exciting time. We will be here on the Soccer OG, either from the studio or on the road. Please like and subscribe. Thank you for the support. And let's get this job done. Let's do a little homework. Let's get it done.